Hello and welcome to the Big Data Deep Dive with The Cube here on EMC TV. I'm Richard Schlesinger and I'm here with tech industry entrepreneur and Wikibon analyst Dave Vellante and SiliconANGLE CEO and Editor-in-Chief John Furrier. We are discussing big data for a better world, how big data analysis can impact everything from farming methods in Uganda to policing patterns in New York City. So welcome to you guys, the Cube guys. I appreciate you being with us. Always fun to hear from you. Um, are people paying attention to the less fortunate? I mean, to you know, big data is a powerful tool, but it's an expensive tool. Is there a, uh, an awareness of that, that nonprofits could use this technology, that technology for good is something to pay attention to? I, th I mean, I, th I see definitely um, traction in this area, and, and, and it starts uh, with government 2.0 initiative we see with Obama, which was you know an open government. Although you know people will criticize that, it really has been a good effort. And what you've seen with big data is is the ability to use technology in a way that you don't have to be a super geek to do that. So we're seeing the role of a data scientist and other roles where people who understand uh, solutions and pro uh, solutions to problems can now use big data to solve those. So you don't have to be a big company, and so you can get things done faster. And you can ask new questions and solve those new problems. And, and you can do that in a, you, uh, on, on issues that improve the quality of life for people. Sure. I mean, well, this concept of open gov government is a good one, but of course it's selective. Some parts of government want to share their data. Others, you know, like the, the budget office might and the NSA might not. Um, and I think that is beginning to permeate to nonprofits and others. But this notion of crowdsourcing is what's fundamental to that concept. Because you get more people involved, more minds. You know, right, the wisdom a, of the a crowd. Million heads are right. better than one, right? Yeah. Well, the other thing that's happening as part of this trend is the ability to do uh, technology ventures has reduced because with open source technology, the barriers to start something and create a new solution are much lower. And now you have with big data the ability to actually cause uh, change is very low. So the, it's, it doesn't take a lot. It takes a little energy, and you have a lot of people out there who want to do good, and big data is a great path for helping people. And it takes data. It's like, it's like there's you a lot of my that. mind. That's what I wanted to talk about, because we found a uh, group of data scientists who spend their weekends mining data for nonprofits and NGOs. They call themselves data kind, or the word that I love, generous geeks. So uh, take a look at what they did once uh, recently on one of their free weekends. weekend we're doing our first ever data dive. We decided to go on this mission and try to build this bridge between the data science community, the nonprofits, NGOs, international organizations, and say, what are your data problems and, and how could you how could you use our help? Sometimes fertilizer, even if you know it will increase your yields, does not make sense to invest in against other needs. For example, education of your children, maybe even feeding your children. We were hoping that we could have more brains sort of involved in looking at our data and deciding what kind of practices are happening in the NYPD. Are they in fact discriminatory like we're hearing? Uh, or are they not? Nonprofits have a great need right now to do analysis of data, and there just aren't a lot of resources at those nonprofits or at those government agencies to do those things. What I'm really optimistic about is that they'll actually be able to help us figure out ways that we can use new tools and technology to get data um, out to the rest of the world faster and easier. Our primary goal is that by the end of the weekend, each one of these organizations has learned something new about the data that they brought here. Data scientists are completely uh, turned on by data. The better, the cleaner, the newer, the fresher the data, the sexier it is. It's sexy if you can actually make a difference. And that's, that's what this data is. It's collected um, by people who want to make a difference for that goal. 
I'm a data scientist. I'm a graduate student in statistics. I'm a statistician. I'm a data analyst for a hedge fund. I am a database engineer. I'm an epidemiologist. I'm a data scientist at uh, online dating site. This happens to be the skills that, that I have and a lot of these other folks have, and we'd like to put them to good use. You're just doing the analysis -y stuff. There's a lot of data on the, the wiki page. I also have a PDF that explains what the actual values on the bottom are. Do you guys have a starting point on cleaning and analyzing the data? We need to get a, an SCP client on your computer, and I actually realized I have one. Give me, give me two minutes. I'm not going to know what that means. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm 100% committed till midnight. That's the that's the minimum cutoff for me. Closer to the end of the night, you feel more excited than you were at the start of the day, and so now we just want to stay here longer. <laughs> We have so much cool stuff. I'm looking forward to today's presentations because there's so much stuff that happened over the course of the last 24 hours that I don't even know about. We tried to do the la latitude longitude conversions in post GIS. The problem really lies in the data provider level. There seemed to be some kind of seasonal trend. The processes to assess it and the right data has been set up. The very significant thing that we're coming a, a, away with in terms of the actual work that was done here was a very clean package um, that, that is a, a building block for a lot of the work that we'll do in the future. It's going to make it easier for you know my mother or my next door neighbor to lend to you know a woman so she could buy a sewing machine in Sub-Saharan Africa. Moving forward with the data, I'll feel stronger about uh, the claims that I'm making and the kind of analyses that I'm running on the data. This organization is amazing. I think that that's amazing that through big data, I can connect with people that I'll never meet, I'll never see, and I can make an impact on their lives. It's really exciting like, to be able to do something that we think will actually improve the world. If you can be like a little part of the machinery that like affects change, then I think that's kind of cool. And I think my generation will have a good, sort of an important role in that. The idea of, of really being able to, to take these raw materials that are the data and, and bring them all the way through the process to where you can explain to someone exactly what's happening. I mean, that's the most satisfying thing in the world, to be able to say, like, I took this thing that used to be a mystery, whether it was small or large, and now isn't. That's a profound thing that you've done, and I think that being able to do that is a tremendous contribution to society. Thank you guys so much. It was awesome. I love watching that piece because um, it, it shows how data can be sort of democratized, be used for, for everything. It doesn't have to be just for big business, for big enterprise, it can be for real good. Is there a sense in the alpha geek community, if you will, um, that there's a necessity to, to, to do this kind of work? I mean, is there a social conscience? Well, I think the open source movement really underscores that social uh, con uh, uh, conscience. And I know I can speak from the standpoint of when we started Wikibon, we had two major inspirations. One was Jimmy Wales, who we met in Boston, and he had started Wikipedia. And the other was Don Tapscott, who wrote a book called Wikinomics. And the fundamental premise of both of those initiatives was really share everything, collaboration, you know, get the crowd in involved and make it open and make it shareable. And I know, when, John, when you started Silicon Angle, you had a, a similar philosophy. Yeah, I mean, there's an old expression in the social web, make things available, and, and, and that brings more people in. People call it freemium on the business side. But I think the alpha geeks see um, things like this because there's always a bottoms-up kind of organic
organic growth and new technologies. And you know, whether you're going back to the early days of Steve Jobs until when he took over Apple, think differently. You know, the geeks can see possibilities in, in technologies. So, so here, uh, you see geeks seeing the impact of education, impact to healthcare, impact to government. So you, there's a lot of involvement. I think really it's early and not a lot of people know about it. There's more, more evangeliz evangelization needs to be get done around it. But I wonder how much awareness there is in the, in the nonprofit and the NGO community um, of the possibilities that well, the interview at Strata was amazing uh, with Virginia. She really is applying big data because what, what she's showing here is that... Yeah, Virginia, tell us who Virginia is. Um, Virginia is with... Um, it's Virginia Carlson. Virginia Carlson, yeah. I've got so many I interviews. can help you. Virginia Carlson, so many interviews we've done, over 800 days. Know. You know, but, but she was one of my favorites at Strata. She's talking about how she's using big data to change the, the, the environment around uh, providing care. And uh, what's interesting is that all the data is available but no one's ever rolled it up and actually look at what's happening. So this highlights a big trend that we're seeing where people actually can instrument their business or environment and actually look at actual data. This eliminates panels and surveys and guessing to go to actual data and actually do the, and, the right she thing. Works, Virginia Carlson works in the city of Chicago on what issues? Well, the issue is how the government spends their money to provide uh, care to uh, uh, people who don't have a lot of means. And the money's wasted because people are guessing based upon some sort of statistical old data. What she's using big data for is to look at real-time data, look at specific population and trend data, and bring supplies and care to the people who need the most at the right time. And it used to be very difficult to do without big data. Now with big data, she's actually doing it. So and there, this but is she's a, having some problems. Problems, right? But she's having some problems because not a lot of people want to continue that kind of funding. So, you know, this is where the alpha geeks see the possibility. This is truly a game changing situation where it will completely change how the government disperses the money. Well, what's interesting about this interview that we're about to play is that she also talks about the kind of data that she can get now and how difficult it is. So, I'll let you tee up. Introduce Virginia Carlson. Here's Virginia Carlson. She's doing amazing things. We support her. Watch this video and think this is possible in every aspect of our life and on business to instrument actually what's going on and optimize for that. It's a great video. Take a watch. Okay, we're back live at Strata. We are in the afternoon program here at theCUBE, SiliconAngle.tv's uh, flagship telecast where we go out to the top events in tech and explore and get the signal from the noise, extract that and share that with you. And we're joined here with Virginia Carlson, who's from Chicago, Metropolitan Chicago Information Center. Center. You guys are a nonprofit uh, and you do a lot of work with data. So first, welcome to theCUBE. Thank you. Thank and you. let's talk you. about data. So tell us data. your impressions of Strata and what's going on in the data world from your angle? Well, this is my second time at Strata. I was here last year, and as I think a lot of people felt last year, it's so good to be together with a tribe where you can sit down and all, um, almost immediately get into a conversation about sort of, you know, uh, universe versus sampling, and you know, everyone on the table understands what you're talking about. So it's fabulous to be here. What's happening? I mean, what's old and what's new? Because there's all this sure. talk about data warehousing, business intelligence, same story, new wine, different bottle, kind of whatever <laughs> the metaphor you want to use. But we're seeing new trends like predictive analytics and real time or whatever that means on whatever parsed definition. Right, so what's right. your angle on this? Well, where are we? Uh, I'll talk a little bit about where we sit. The MCIC, Metro Chicago Information Center, sits uh, as a sort of funnel between big data uh, and historical big data and the common good public good organizations on the ground that would have needed those data, that still need those data. Um, for example, anything from a local, local American Indian healthcare center that needs to understand where to open a new clinic to a larger uh, philanthropic organization like the MacArthur Foundation who wants to know whether or not its local community efforts are making a difference. So we try to do that date what we call the data intermediary piece, curate the data, analyze it, visualize it, give them the findings. Tell us um, from your perspective, because you have to go out and scour sources, find sources, right. because right. it's all, that's that's the that's the drug. You need source of data. So tell us what's it like out there. How did you find sources? Are they rolling in now? Is there inter is there intermediaries that you are you brokering the data? Are you a data broker? Wait, wait, how does someone get sources? And what's right. scrappiness? You right. need right. you need right. street smarts. You need 
Well, for the historical perspective, you know, we were founded 22 years ago to do 3,000 household survey uh, projects every year because there wasn't enough data to do local planning and policy development. That went away in 2002 as more administrative and operational data became available from governments uh, and as uh, there was less but worse response rates from surveys, basically. So turning to open data and sources at that point, 2002, you had to FOIA most of it. Now there's the big open government movement, and now, you know, sort of folks selling their souls, if you will, selling their, their, their private data to Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and all the rest of that. So from our perspective, big data is... I want to say a double-edged sword, but it may be a single-edged sword, and that as as more and more data are collected by private sector companies, there is less available data for social service organizations that need public data to do public planning. So are you saying there's data hoarding going on? Are people hoarding the data? Or they want to just control it? Uh, it should I'm, be a I show called use, Data Hoarders. <laughs> That's actually a good cable show. We should run that. Data Hoarders. You know. Data Hoarders. Facebook, yeah. you're hoarding data. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's their business model. They need to monetize. What they're doing is selling you back your own data in the form of services and advertisements, and that's that's how they, they're making money. But what it's doing is it's, it's, it's sort of... Um, Choking. Choking, there's a good word. Other sources of data that people might use um, that might be more public, less confidential, and that dries things up for us. And, and, and the open gov movement in particular is, is all about getting operational and administrative data from the federal and local governments. So how does someone get involved, the average person who cares about this? Because there are a lot of people who do care. Okay, if, 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 if so much data is being made private, confidential, folks are giving away their data to, to Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, all the, the, the sort, of, sort of big three, how can those data be used for, a so, for, the, for social good? For, for example, what if we could get uh, Google search results on folks in different census tracts and how what they're looking for as their vision is fading and use that to help the centers for, uh, you know, Guild for the Blind figure out what sorts of vision impairments are going on. Yeah. So so my, my column, the conversation that needs to happen is with privacy and confidentiality, how can we get the private sector data into the hands of local people trying to work on common good uh, problems? Well, let's explore that a little bit. What what responsibility do you think companies like Facebook have, and and, and how do we get to that point? How do we get them to uh, companies like that to share that data, to make it available? Um, what role do they have to play? And what would your message be to them if they're watching right now? Well, my dream would be that they would uh, see this as a philanthropic uh, opportunity Community. There are other ways to do that. A, a number of them have have sort of a philanthropic arm where they'll lend out their data scientists for problems. Mm -hmm. But I'd like to suggest to them that their, their data is just as as uh, valuable as the skills the data scientists have. And we should begin a conversation around how and in what, under what conditions privacy and confidentiality can be preserved at the same time that they start thinking about uh, you know, sort of how letting the letting the data free. I mean, if data wants to be free, as they say, um, let's let's use it for for public good. I don't, yeah. Virginia, thanks for coming inside thanks. the cube. We personally have uh, care about this society benefit. Ben, uh, benefit. Um, you know, Dave and I were talking last night uh, around how society can benefit from big data. The stuff that you're doing in your work is phenomenal. It's exactly the kind of use cases that the I call commercial vendors don't necessarily talk because they're not in that business of actually helping human beings. But the, in the healthcare example and or doing planning around making society a better mm -hmm. place, mm -hmm. big data can completely streamline and make so much more operational efficiency around stuff that's already existing, that data. So I personally believe in what you're doing. Thank you for sharing Thanks. with us. Thanks for um, keep in touch with us. Let us know how okay. we can get a hold of you because uh, we want to promote your work. You know, it's interesting because she's, she, this is sort of the flip side of, of open government, which everybody thinks is a good idea. But she's suffering a little bit because of the open government and the concentration on open government. Why is why is that not the kind of information that she needs? No, she needs data that's real time, you know, that guides her to the solution now so that she can cut the waste 
And let's face it, we all know that there's a lot of waste. And so she's very, being very bold uh, with this initiative. And so, so she wants that. She wants what a lot of people consider dry statistical census type data. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, and not the sample. She wants the whole corpus of data, as we were everything. talking about earlier. Yeah, more, absolutely. More so is better. No sampling. Just give me everything. And so after the interview, John, she, she kept talking to you. Um, yeah. Tell us a little bit about what she said when the camera was turned off. Uh, well, I don't want to really kind of go in too much detail and get her in trouble, but what she essentially <laughs> was saying was she wants to provide that kind of data mashup because she, she's identified the ability to do, use real-time information sets of data from silos and put them all into one together to provide real-time value. But ultimately, it's not just about the solution. It's an obvious benefit, but there are people that are in her way because they want to stop her from being successful. And as nothing to do with helping people. It's about the money. Who are the people? People who are the old, have the old way of controlling the money through initiatives and causes that were statistically being supported by bad data. So the bad data was driving a lot of the distribution of the money to help the needy. In this case, she has a real solution to show real data to solve real problems in real time and it's being blocked. Yeah, it always comes down to this one thing. Information is power, right? She's got information that challenges. She's threatening the status quo. She's disrupting in a very positive way. And this is why you're seeing an Occupy Wall Street movement. That's why you're seeing Twitter rise up. Wow. The crowdsourcing information is real time and it's powerful. And that's really, I mean, that's, the, that's where the rubber meets the road, if you will pardon the cliche, in big yeah. data. It's all about the power. Disruption. Yeah, it's all about disruption. Well, thank you both. I mean, this, is, this has just been great. Uh, it's sort of a, a, a different way of looking at big data, a way that big data can do good and we of course thank you boys uh, John and Dave for your great insights and 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 really really good knowledge on all this stuff and uh, we have more installments of the big data deep dive coming up so stay tuned to the conversation with my new best friends from the cube right here on EMC TV